I'll call this meeting to order. We'll start with consent agenda. All the following items which concern reports and items of a routine nature normally approved at AHA meetings will be approved by one vote unless any trustee desires to have a separate vote on any or all these items. The consent agenda consists of a discussion, consideration, and action on the following items. Minutes of the Finance Committee meeting on March 17, 2014. Minutes of the Monthly Trustee meeting on March 18, 2014. And a check report March 12, 2014 through April 7, 2014. Mr. Chairman, I move we uh, approve the consent agenda to include the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting, minutes of the Monthly Trustee meeting, and the check report. Second. We have a motion by Terry Klein and a second by Kayla Simon to approve the consent agenda as it was read. Roll call vote, please. Brown? Yes. Klein? Yes. Gasper? Yes. Kinsey? Yes. Sanderson? Yes. Simon? Yes. The next item is the BKD audit report. You going to take over, Chris? I can. All right. Very good. Um, I want to make sure everybody's got. One of these little, one of these little jewels. You good? Okay. If it seems like I was just presenting this audit, it's because I was uh, sort of midstream. Um, and what I wanted to share with you today was sort of where the audit wound up overall, as you all remember from my presentation back in October, November, maybe November. November was that uh, we had a few open items on the audit, and they turned out to be. Uh, source of some pretty significant adjustments. So I want to visit a little bit about those. So as you look at this document, I'm going to sort of hit high points rather than read the whole thing to you because okay. much of the material uh, has already been presented. Ultimately, the audit has a clean opinion on it. Um, and I'm looking here at the second page now. The audit has a clean opinion on it. We did include going concern language. Uh, 2000, uh, 2013 was... Uh, pretty rough year, and aside from some uh, you know, some loans and some other some other things that we had to get into, profitability was not was not great. Um, but equity was um, was not in great shape. Well, not in great shape either. I hear that the hospitals. Uh, sort of turning around and beginning to, to develop the census and get back where we want to go. So with any luck, we can get rid of that qualification for 2014. Um, we did have a couple of material weaknesses in internal control. And rather than go through those in detail later on, <coughs> a couple of them were segregation of duties type issues. Um, one of them related to just the magnitude of the audit adjustments that we wound up posting and one of them related to the process that existed at June 30, 2013 for estimating and recording allowances on your accounts receivable. Um, Kevin has grilled us mercilessly on why those, uh, why those adjustments occurred, and um, we've shared the information and calculations that we used, um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we won't, we won't have those, we won't have those issues uh, going forward. Um, at Kevin's previous employer, he also worked with, with BKD, and, and we ruined him there um, mm -hmm. as far as uh, these calculations go. So the, the calculations that we do here are similar to what you were doing, um, and the testing approach that we use and all of that is similar. So um, the, I don't have any concerns that we'll be okay at the end of the year okay. you know, with those issues. Turning over to page three, I've got two columns here. What I'm trying to show you with this information is what was the impact of the journal entries um, on your net income, if you will. <coughs> and the left-hand column is the one that I reported to you previously when I was here. The question marks are where the open items were. The right-hand column are the adjustments as they, as they wound up in final form. Um, the biggest issues there, obviously, are uh, recording the Medicare cost report, which wasn't completed at the time that, we, uh, that I reported back in November. Uh, the bigger pieces, though, were the allowances on accounts receivable um, and, and sort of across the board. Um, when, when we sort of got into the, the information and were able to receive the reports that we needed, it turns out that... Um, 
there were allowances that had been computed of $720,000 that had not been recorded on the books. And uh, in addition to those, uh, we felt like another $460,000 were needed. Uh, at, at June 30, um, and you don't have the audit reports in front of you, but one of the things that you notice when you look at the June 30 breakdown of your accounts receivable is that our private pay had gone up dramatically. And by their nature, those receivables need to be pretty darn heavily reserved. It's a rare hospital that gets into a double-digit collection percentage on those. So, so that's, um, that's the 30,000 foot view. Uh, those are, and you can see that the big entries that we had were on the, primarily on the open items uh, there. Bottom line ultimately was um, a negative, what we call change in net position, um, which overall is net income of 800, almost $828,000. And again, two issues there. One of them is a, a decrease in net patient service or revenue, uh, coupled with, a, with, with an increase in, in expenses, and that's a bad, that's a bad combination. Um, and I guess what I think is that uh, had those, one of the reasons that we call those audit adjustments a material weakness is that had those been recorded throughout the year, it may have changed some of the decisions that the board and management made. Sure. And so that'll, that's all those, so what start out to be accounting issues can really affect your operations as well, ultimately, if you make decisions on information that's overstated your bottom line. Yeah. Any questions on that? Okay, a couple of things for comparison here. I've got about four charts that I want to show you sort of how you compare. 2012 and 2013, the first one here is the current ratio. And what I'm comparing you to are, uh, this, this red bar is out of the Optum Almanac, which is basically using cost report information and other publicly available information on hospitals to put benchmarks out there for, for comparable hospitals. And the benchmark that I put here is rural hospitals under $10 million uh, in revenue across the U.S., which is you're sort of at the other end of that. Um, but our, our current ratio is, uh, at the time, was uh, below one, uh, meaning that for every dollar of current liability we had, we had, I believe, about uh, 89 cents to, to satisfy that. And, you know, part of that was the, the million and a half that we borrowed from the, from the foundation, from the trust. So that was still, majority of that was still sitting in cash a year. And moving along, um, and I guess what I would say is, if your current ratio is below, below one to one, that, that's not a solvent, generally a solvent position to be in. You were close, you were headed in the right direction, and if we could do that without incurring additional debt um, and get back up, Get back, get back up about one is sort of the minimum position I would think that you would want to be at. Um, days revenue and accounts receivable. On this statistic, lower is better. Um, and you can see that even with our adjustments on accounts receivable of uh, almost a million one, almost a million, a little more than a million one, uh, dragging that, that days number down we were still at about 75 days in accounts receivable at June 30. That means basically we had two months revenue sitting, or a little more than two months revenue sitting in accounts receivable rather than sitting in cash. And getting back down to that, that benchmark of 45, 50, 55 days, which is where we see most coins in your position, getting back down to that benchmark, and preferably by collecting the cash and not by writing off receivables, suddenly you put yourself in, a, in at least a better cash position. These, these uh, accounts receivable are included in your current ratio, so it doesn't really increase your current ratio, but it's hard to spend accounts receivable. Um, moving on to your average payment period, this is a measure of how long on average it takes you to pay off a kind of liability. And the average payment period for the hospital, now this is not just accounts payable for those of you who are used to seeing a days and accounts payable statistic. This is all current liabilities, so including your vacations payable, uh, salaries payable, uh, accounts payable, and the current portion of your long-term debt. We're running it right around 140 days. 
uh, the benchmark is somewhere around 50. And then finally, our, our day's cash on hand from all sources, we actually fared a little better than the benchmark at uh, June 30, 2013, and almost 60 days. The benchmark is about 54 days, but still bear in mind that that, that difference is largely borrowed funds. And, uh, and then finally, on the back page there, uh, your, your total margin. Um, and, and I guess what I would try to illustrate with this is that some hospitals do really well, some hospitals do really poorly, but when you sort of average them all together, and look at the, or not average, if you look at the median in that range, hospitals in this in this size category are breaking even. Yeah. As, a, as a group, so. Again, not, not where you want to be. I've got some detail uh, on the page that says internal controls, material weaknesses, those are the issues that we talked about. Um, talked about segregation of duties, including review of journal entries and bank recs prepared by the CFO. I suspect that's already been. Um, I suspect that's already been addressed. We also had some other deficiencies um, on the page now that says internal or uh, yeah, internal controls, other deficiencies. Uh, these are all issues that we talked about before as well. Um, just situations where we where we got folks that had access uh, to the hospital's assets and the ability to account for them or reconcile uh, reconcile them as well. And that's not a position you can be in. But I have said that these are, I feel like those risks are largely mitigated, but they still reach a level where I have to report them that these are not things that are keeping me away from them. Uh, we had a couple of other observations. We talked about the held checks lot last time. We talked a little bit about fraud hotline uh, implementation. Um, one of the studies that we suggest is that um, fraud hotlines and using that approach are the most effective way to get fraud reported, provided, you know, among providers that actually want to know about fraud, they found that um, fraud hotlines are the best way to, to get that information, and it's something like 70% more effective than other methods that are that are out there and available. Um, so it might be worth looking at what your what your processes are and looking at best practices on that. The other thing I want to throw out that I didn't talk about last time because this is a relatively new development are electronic health record audit risks. Uh, Medicare program and Medicaid program integrity contractors. I know Candace is giving me the look. <laughs> no, I'm just waiting for which part of it. Which part? The record it? itself or the system. No, it's actually, there, there are two pieces to it. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is program integrity contractors, Medicare and Medicaid both, are doing two types of audits. One of them is compliance audits. And what they do with compliance audits is they go in and say, we're going to look at your documentation. And you attested to meaningful, uh, 90 days of meaningful use. And if we can blow up your documentation to show that you didn't meet the stage one meaningful use criteria, that incentive payment we want our money back. goes away, all of it. The second thing that they do, now the interesting, about, the interesting thing about that and the things that we've seen our clients struggle with is that you've got a CPA business type firm doing the audit work, okay? And they're trying to audit information that's maintained by IT people. And while most of the general public doesn't distinguish between accounting nerds and IT nerds. They sort of think it's the same kind of nerd. That they actually don't speak the same language. Um, so we've seen communication issues uh, abound in that process. Um, the other thing that we see is uh, what we call uh, payment audits. And as you recall, your electronic health record incentive payments are based on statistics. Okay. Auditors come in and they want to look at dollars and cents. But if they can poke holes in how you, you capture your information, or if we've claimed a Medicare day that wasn't a Medicare day, or misbilled something, or um, we're not doing our shadow bills for Medicare Advantage, or we claim that we did, but they didn't process on the PSNR, or uh, things of that nature, they can actually have a pretty significant impact on 
They won't take the whole payment away, but they can get part of it. And the third type of audit we're seeing, and this is all on the payment side, big picture program side. Um, the third type we're seeing is Medicaid audits, where they, they don't really go after meaningful use. It's more, you know, again, more looking at the, the Medicaid statistics that you claim to see if the payment amount you've gotten is appropriate. The other thing that we're starting to see a little bit of, and I don't have enough, um, we don't see a, a whole lot of evidence of this. We have seen at least one situation, I was telling Candace about this earlier, where the OIG will go in and look at system logs for a specific uh, provider, a specific physician, okay? And they'll make, you, they'll make the argument that based on metadata in that system, they can tell that that physician had four client medical records open at the same time. And what they're alleging is that physician could not have appropriately charted what would keep that physician from charting one patient's information in another patient's chart and so on and so forth and saying the documentation doesn't support medical necessity. So this the CHR thing, what sort of looked like for a PPS hospital to be sort of a boon, uh, you know, a good source of dollars turns out down the road to be sort of a, a source of a gotcha game for, for Medicare and Medicaid and the program integrity contractors. So I guess what I would say is um, keep an ear to the ground. We're hearing these stories a lot. Um, hasn't hit Oklahoma in a big way yet, but it's coming. There are big dollars at stake. Questions on that? Okay, the last thing that I want to share with you is the next to the last page in your packet. And I can't remember if I talked with you about this last time we were here. Uh, Kevin was telling me that you guys have had a change in your sales tax. It's now, I guess, available for operations. Okay. Good stuff. We're seeing county commissioners and uh, city, city councils um, looking very hard at the sales tax that our, that our clients are getting. It's a very hot topic these days. And one of the things that we wanted to be able to help our clients understand to talk to those folks about is what benefit the or what impact the hospital has on the community. And we can make the anecdotal arguments like if we weren't here, the business that comes to the community would, would not be attracted. Um, we take care of the, the health of our community. Um, we provide emergent care to people who would not have it available if they weren't here. We can make those arguments. What we've tried to do is also make a financial argument. And what we're saying with this is, um, for this hospital, and Jane, you're in here too, the nursing homes uh, included in these numbers, um, we bring $3.6 million of Medicare and Medicaid dollars into this community. If this hospital weren't here, that $3.6 million would go somewhere else. Okay, so those, that's outside federal and state dollars into this community, and that's that's net, not gross. So that's not the coinsurance and other things of that nature. So it's the outside dollars. We provide a million three of uncompensated care uh, to the extent that we provide charity care, we provide care to Medicaid beneficiaries, and the care costs more than we're getting paid by Medicaid. And we provide free care to people who can't or won't pay their bills that we write off in the form of bad debt. Million three of benefit to the community, just in terms of the cost of care to those to, to people in those categories. Our salaries and wages are five point nine million dollars, and our full time equivalents are about one hundred and fifty. So that's not the employees. That's the number of hours we have divided by 2,080 hours. Uh, we're paying them on average 36,000 bucks a year. Those are, that, that's providing $6 million worth of good jobs in our community. Research done at our own beloved Oklahoma State University, my wife heard me say that, she would kick me in the mouth, <laughs> um, suggests that when you have a rural hospital that 36% I think I did that math right. 34% it's in there. But I don't have my reading glasses on. 34% of the salary dollars that are generated by the hospital are rippled into the community 
for people who support the hospital and the hospital's employees. Another checker at the at the at the, uh, at the grocery store or an extra car hop at the Sonic or you know those sorts of those sorts of jobs. So in addition to that, using Oklahoma State University math, which you know is top notch math, uh, <coughs> another million four of additional community salaries and additional fifty eight full time equivalents in the community. So you add those things up and you look at what the community is investing in the hospital. And from a pure dollars and cents point, what the community is getting back from the hospital. I mean, if I could invest my dollars at that rate, I would. Uh, it's, a, it's a sound investment in the community. Not to mention uh, the soft, squishy stuff that makes us account for something. So that's what I have by way of presentation. Uh, if you have questions. My contact information is on the back, or if you have questions now, I'll do my best to answer them. Does anyone have any questions for Chris? I don't really have a question, Chris. I just have to say that I really appreciate the way you explain things and really the way you kind of are looking out for the long term of the hospital, not just writing a report and saying, okay, this is what you got. Um, I've only been sitting on this board a couple of years, and so it's hard sometimes to get a, my head around everything that's going on, but you kind of break it down nicely so that I can actually understand what you're saying, and I, I greatly appreciate the extra effort that you put in to make sure we understand what's going on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Kevin, do you have anything you want to add to any of that? No, I don't. Okay. No, I don't. Thank you, Chris. Chris, thank you. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to get back to Tulsa. <laughs> <laughs> Drive safely. Well, yeah. Trying yeah. yeah. to hit me, dear. Defensively <laughs> between yeah. 935. <laughs> All right. I would entertain a motion then to approve or disapprove the BKD audit. I move that we approve the BKD audit report for 2012-2013. A second. We have a motion by Dr. Kinsey, a second by Darling Sanderson to approve the BKD audit report for 2012-2013. Roll call vote, please. Brown? Yes. Klein? Yes. Gasper? Yes. Kinsey? Yes. Sanderson? Yes. Simon? Yes. Next is the CEO's report. Candace? Okay. Just to let you know that we have um, now physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy available um, at all times for the skilled program at the nursing home uh, to assist with the re rehab needs of the residents. We also will be able to have OT here at the hospital, which it's been a very, very long time since we've provided that service. So, um, we're really excited to be able to add those to our services. Um, Lindsay Pruitt will be taking the test to become certified um, DOT provider. Um, there's been a new law passed recently that um, by May 21st you have to be a uh, certified provider to do those DOT physicals, so Lindsay will be taking that test soon. We've had um, students from Northwestern and from Northwest Technology Center that have been uh, doing clinicals and training and have received um, lots of positive comments um, from those instructors on their experience here at SHARE, which we appreciate their participation. Um, we're also starting a caregiver support group, uh, which will be on a monthly basis and will be held at the Homestead. Uh, we are going to be receiving um, the, the Chamber of Commerce um, Chamber Member of the Month. That will be on April 18th, not March 21st. I don't know where I got that. But that will be this Friday at 8 o'clock um, at Northwestern. Uh, tomorrow at noon is our second meeting for the Community Health Needs Assessment. And that meeting is at the VOTEC. Um, the first economic impact report um, was posted on our website 
and on Facebook. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we are planning our volunteer appreciation banquet, which is going to be on April the 29th. It will be at 6 o'clock in um, the Ranger Room at Northwestern. We're celebrating 63 individuals and groups for their um, efforts, um, volunteer efforts during 2013, and they provided 4,307 hours uh, to Sher Medical Center in volunteer hours. Uh, that's huge. They're, we couldn't do it without our volunteers, and again, uh, we we're going to recognize them for that. Uh, Christy Williard has accepted the Director of Nurses position at the nursing home. Christy begins on Thursday. We're excited to have Christy back. Um, and thank you to Georgia Mullins for helping recruit Christy back. And Georgia's actually been back this week um, in the interim, and she's going to serve as um, a mentor for Christy during this time. Uh, this is a new role for Christy, and so Georgia's going to help us out with that. We appreciate it. It was good to see her back. Um, working on the HCAPs. Um, trying to remind patients to that they'll to expect a call from JL Morgan. It's really hard for us to get responses because people hang up. And those are very important um, surveys for us. So they're trying to uh, be more active in notifying the patients um, to expect those calls and working on um, improving scores. Mary Rose and her staff in the surgery department have um, been working really hard to reorganize, get ready for survey. Uh, Dr. Co Dr. Ransom has had very positive comments um, on their performance lately, and we want to recognize uh, Mary and her staff for that. Upfront collections for the month of March, we're just under our goal of 30000 EHR status report, um, as you probably know, Chase, Brandy, and Jamie resigned their positions a couple weeks ago. Um, we have hired Alan Vaughn as our new IT director. Alan will start on Monday. Uh, Melissa Headley as a clinical analyst. Rhonda Nicewanger as a part-time um, assistant for her. Um, Steve Young we have hired as an independent um, third-party consultant and coordinator uh, for the IT project. And he came in to do uh, kind of a gap analysis and, and help us understand um, what our needs are at this point. Um, he came in, looked at our workflows, and is making suggestions to improve those. So we'll be working closely with those folks to um, achieve our goal of meeting meaningful use. We're supposed to start a testing um, July 1 uh, for stage 1, year 2. So. Um, Lots of work to do between now and then, and Steve is also helping us um, get our new people up to speed and get the training done that they need, so uh, we're excited to get started on that. Um, SHARE Hospice staff uh, recognized the doctors for National Physicians Day on March 28th by delivering donuts to them, and uh, SHARE Medical Center recognized the doctors um, with a gift certificate um, to Freeman's Garden Market to say thank you for all they do. Several staff members attended an OHA meeting uh, last month um, in preparation to get ready for survey. Uh, the presenter was Darlene Bainbridge. She has a um, quality software tool that uh, we are subscribing to to help us meet our um, quality needs um, for survey purposes for CMS and for State of Oklahoma and we actually are up running and trying to get information loaded into that. It is very cool. This is, Darlene is a nurse and she developed this tool because she saw time after time that hospitals couldn't wrap their arms around it, couldn't seem to follow through with, with all of the things um, that, that we are supposed to do with her on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. She's put all this into a software tool that alerts uh, managers and staff, um, you know, you need to go do this. So it, it's a really neat tool that will help us be more accountable and help us be more successful. So we're working on getting um, that up to speed and 
she had made the comment that she has seen it turn a three-day state survey and CMS survey into a half-day survey. So that's pretty exciting that you, that we could look forward to being that on top of that and having it at your fingertips, not worrying about somebody being out of the office and not knowing where those reports are or can't get to it on a computer. Uh, we'll all have access to those reports at any given time. So pretty excited about that. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay. If not, thank you, Candace. I would uh, entertain a motion to approve or disapprove Chair Mackle's Center written report. Well, Chairman, I move we uh, approve the uh, Chair Medical Center uh, written report. Second. We have a motion by Terry Klein, a second by Hala Simon to approve the Chair Medical Center written report to include hospital, hospice, and convalescent home quality measures, HCAP score measures for April 15, 2014. Roll call vote, please. Brown? Yes. Klein? Yes. 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 Next is CFO's report. Okay. Kevin? Okay. Uh, just to let you know, in the month of March, we still have $550,000 operating cash. That represents 18.2 days worth of cash on hand. Uh, our accounts receivable increased for the hospital by $29,000. Uh, that increase is mainly due to our unbilled went up by a little over $200,000, and we've been talking with physicians. We've actually had to outsource uh, our billing part for our coding part of that of that issue, and so that seems to be getting resolved. Uh, days actually went up because of that. Our net days are at 41.4 compared to 38 days last month. Uh, accounts receivable or accounts payable actually decreased by sixty-six thousand dollars from last month. We're still at eight hundred seventy-three thousand dollars. That represents seventy-five point seven days uh, of operating expenses. Uh, gross patient revenue we did see an increase there of over three hundred thousand dollars at one point six million dollars. Uh, every area saw an increase. The hospital seen an increase. Uh, the homestead seen an increase as well as the nursing home. Uh, the hospital's increase is mainly due to the outpatient volume. The nursing home had an increase due to an accounting adjustment that we had to do with the difference between some revenue that we had to move from the hospital uh, to the nursing home. And then, of course, the homestead was a little busier as well. Uh, patient days, we were down 21 patient days from last month. We had 78 patient days in March compared to 99 days in February. Clinic visits in the office was actually up by 30. We had 591 visits in March. We had 561 in February. And the nursing home actual daily census dropped by 1.9 patients. We had 52.6. Uh, contractuals for last month, uh, for every dollar we took in, we wrote off 66 cents. Uh, so that was a little bit larger than usual. We did write off $125,000 to the collection agency. We didn't give any charity care away. Um, Salaries and wages did increase by 58128 That's mainly due to we had three extra days in the month, and we're based on a cool basis, so you have some extra salaries due to that. Uh, we did have net operating loss from all institutions of 192314 and after sales tax and everything else, we had an actual net loss of $82,556. Uh, one of the items I want to say is the sales tax. I had to estimate the sales tax that was on the financials. I had to estimate $135,000. Uh, because we didn't know until Friday what the actual sales tax was, but it was actually $123,000. So we actually took in $12,000 less than what I expected it to be. So you'll see that adjustment made in next month's financials. So uh, that's pretty much the financials. Do you guys have any questions? I'll just uh, make a comment or two. Um, maybe from our finance meetings and, and talking with Kevin, um, been very pleased and impressed and uh, he's working hard there has been a lot of adjustments that have had to be made um, just some corrections that need to be made and uh, he's done a very good job of that and uh, um, I think uh, Candace made a great hire in uh, picking Kevin up and uh, look forward to working with you so thank you thank you all right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Because it's dark. It's cold. <laughs> Always whispering something. Oh, the fair enough. <laughs> I am guilty. The next item is the medical staff executive committee. Dr. Kinsey. All right. We, the uh, medical staff executive committee credentialing committee met, and uh, we recommended reappointment of several staff. So I move that uh, we reappoint to active staff me. <laughs> I guess I can't really can move that. that. <laughs> I don't think I can move that. Somebody else Somebody needs else to do that? Probably needs to do that. I move that we uh, reappoint to active staff Dr. Elizabeth Kinsey. Second. We have a motion by Terry Klein and second by Scott Brown to reappoint to active staff Dr. Elizabeth Kinsey, MD, Internal Medicine and Psychiatry. Roll call vote, please. Brown? Yes. Klein? Yes. Gasper? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Yes. All right, then I'll move that we reappoint to courtesy staff Dr. Jared Kriska in urology and Dr. Donald Nix in radiology. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Kinsey, a second by Scott Brown to reappoint to courtesy staff Dr. Jared. Kruska, MD, Urology, and Dr. Donald Nix, MD, Radiology. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Yes. Gasper? Yes. Kinsey? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, and then finally, uh, I move that we reappoint to Allied Health staff uh, Gerald Darger, CRNA. Uh, he's a nurse anesthetist. Okay. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Kinsey, a second by Scott Brown to reappoint to Allied Health staff Gerald Darger, CRNA. Roll call vote, please. Brown. Yes. 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 And that's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Next, EHR report. Anything additional other than what was in your report? I got a big phone call tomorrow. That's all I know. We're all meeting. And he said we're going to renew our vows. Renew our vows. Okay. <laughs> I can toss out a few things. So. <laughs> I'd like to come to that wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Just talking to Steve and then working with uh, Sue Hyla, who's the tech that we currently have. Um, I think things, uh, things are moving smoothly. She's really easy to work with. They kind of understand the difference between an urgent matter and something that can wait. But I get the feeling that even the things that can wait are on their list still. They're going to get to them. Um, so we've been kind of, uh, I've sent them about a million trillion emails so far <laughs> of different levels of priority and, um, and feel like they're, they're on top of that and we're getting things changed into a system that's going to really uh, probably help us a lot. Um, certainly will get us, I think, to meaningful use. I mean, I think we've got a nice team right now, so I'm good. hopeful. Good. That's good news. Anything else on that? Yep. Okay. Next is the Sheraton Home Report. My head's spinning. Your head's spinning? I mean, this year, so far, every man has been turned over. So far. <laughs> <laughs> so far. Now, here's not up either. <laughs> 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 Anyhow. <laughs> so, we had round one of fighting for the managed, fighting off the managed Medicaid bill, but that's not done by any means. That will take a lot of work. Just trying to keep that in check somewhat where we're not giving away services and nobody can get any Medicaid. So that'll be a lot of work for future. Uh, like I said, the employees or the managers basically have all changed. We are excited because I think it will be a good positive change. We're anxious for poor Christy. Don't know what she's coming to. <laughs> She'll be there Thursday. But she's a little fighter, a little scrapper, and she can get it done. So I believe. 
and that we're excited to have her back. And Georgia has done a fantastic job and will continue to help. And we appreciate that Candace and Mary and Kevin for all the support they've given us during this time and looking. And I have got more RNs now looking for a job. Do you need me to send you some applications? I don't know where they're all coming from. But yes, we do, by the way. I might need send those them. right over. Uh, and we really are excited about the new therapy company. Right now they have uh, four skilled and one independent that they're taking care of, the occupational therapist. And now those people work. They absolutely hustle from one place to the other and take care of the patients and tons of paperwork, but they're doing a fantastic job, and we were fortunate to find them, really. And I think they're seeing somebody over here. That's great, too. So, for the occupational. Mm -hmm. that, if you haven't met that lady, and I'm sure you haven't, but she's quite a character. Yeah, she we're was seeing. over here, actually. Mm -hmm. And I hustle along. Norma Hall, I did want to mention that down there, celebrated her 15-year anniversary with us. She worked in the laundry and the housekeeping for years. She and her husband both, and then he had come to the nursing home. And finally, after a while, she came to live with us too, and still up and going. And she's the president of one end of the resident council, so you know it's pretty exciting for her. That's all I have. There's one uh, particular uh, resident that I saw at church yesterday. He said that his experience has been very good and that uh, he loves to be able to give everybody a hard time. <laughs> well, now, I've got several of them. We <laughs> see them out on their electric scooters, places they're not supposed to be. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> hey, they got electric scooters. The battery will last that long. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Next is the Homestead Report. Kelly? They were on their electric scooters. Apartments uh, <laughs> at the Homestead. Um, uh, we have been um, very busy. The staff have been working very hard um, uh, uh, the last six weeks. Um, right now, um, we have... 42 rooms occupied, and, and when I say occupied, I'm not talking about our storage or our sewing <laughs> machines or anything like that, but um, 42 rooms are occupied. Um, three of those rooms have uh, are part of a compensation package for our uh, staff or contractors, but um, the rest of those are all rented by uh, paying residents at the homestead. Um, we have had a company with interest in uh, multiple furnished units, so we have rented out the majority, actually until today, we had rented out all of our furnished units um, and um, only have two residents that are under the age of 60. So um, we've, we've still, we've managed to, you know, take advantage of this opportunity without, you know, um, I guess totally getting away from our intended purpose of serving seniors. Um, we have just probably as soon as I can get some carpet and flooring put in, um, we'll have our occupancy up to 80%. Um, and I don't know the last time that that has been the case for that facility. Um, but uh, pretty excited about it. Um, it's, uh, it's been real busy. The staff are just really getting after it. And, um, we do have some new staff that are learning the ropes as well, but uh, um, and then we have some special people that live with us that some of you know that we try to keep an eye on. So um, all I can say is it's it's going going real well. Lots of activities, lots of new people, new faces, and um, we're going to hopefully hit up over that ninety mark occupancy within a month or two. I've got. I've got inquiries on every single apartment that's available. So sometimes it takes six months to turn one of those into a rental. Sometimes it takes six weeks. But um, very active over there right now. 
Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Kelly. Anything to report on the foundation? Foundation board met last Thursday. Um, for the third quarter, we had uh, January, February, March, we had $47,005.30 uh, in total gifts. Um, 412 gifts altogether. Largest gift was a $20,000 um, unrestricted um, gift uh, in response to a solicitation we sent out regarding our donor recognition wall. The donor recognition wall should be uh, in place within a couple weeks, I think. Um, and we have a number of um, people in our community that uh, will be uh, listed on that wall and, and a lot of people in this room. So. Thank you to the, everybody in the community and everybody in this room that have uh, helped make a difference with our foundation. Um, we have year to date a net income of $50,373. Um, we have, uh, we call program expenses and that's funding that goes back into the medical center um, for uh, different programs and activities. Um, year to date, $37,934 um, and have received um, total income or, or regular income, uh, which is memorials and donations of $90,992.63. That's down from our, all of those numbers are down from our previous year, but remember in the previous year we were um, dealing with a, a our biggest campaign ever for the electronic health record with shared trust matching funds available and uh, pumping that money um, right back towards the medical center for those projects. So we are down from last year in comparison, um, but we're having a, a really good year for not having uh, a major campaign going on. Um, total assets, um, $401,000 this year versus $214,000 last year. Um, we're very appreciative of this community, and I, I think a lot of hospitals our size would be envious to have a, a philanthropic, philanthropic arm like we have here. So, um, and that's not because of um, anything I'm doing, but uh, this community is very supportive of this hospital and everything's going on. So we're greatly appreciative. All right, thank you, Kelly. Do we have to say anything in this report? Bridget was not able to be here. She had a previous engagement. She will actually be here on Monday this evening. Okay. Anything to report from the City Council? Uh, I don't know that there's anything to report from the City Council. New Year budget for all of our emergency and safety personnel items and uh, new learning for me is that our EMS service is upgrading and has been upgrading and I hope that that's a, a good thing back for here uh, to see that we have paramedics on board and to see that we're uh, updating and adding and improving equipment there is a, a good thing and uh, hopefully the council will be able to make some decisions that will continue to improve those services for the citizens uh, of Alva and the residents that come out here. Very good. Under uh, Chairman's report, I just want to, I guess, give some kudos. We had the experience uh, to be a patient uh, with my third child uh, for three or four days here uh, this last month. And um, we received uh, exceptional care. Uh, everybody was, and, and it was pretty decent numbers. I think there was eight, nine patients every night that uh, we were here. And so the nurses were uh, hopping, uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, we never, uh, had to go looking for a nurse. There was always somebody there for us. The, uh, one night, uh, they even brought in uh, books for us to be able to read to him before he went to bed. I mean, just little things that you wouldn't have that type of care uh, somewhere else. And I'm not just saying that from sitting here in this chair. I'm saying that uh, being thankful as a citizen of Alma that 
that we have this type of facility and we have that type of care uh, that, it, that is provided uh, here uh, in this hospital. I know that we don't uh, always know that until you have to have the care, uh, but as I made my rounds to each room and kind of talked to me as we were here for quite some time, uh, and talked to all the different residents, every one of them uh, to, to a person was uh, thankful. I uh, was thankful for the care that they were receiving. So that could be passed on uh, to, to the staff. I, I would appreciate it uh, very much uh, for the care that we received. I don't have anything else. Is there any other items of new business for anybody else? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.